Hey Unwrappers, we at The Week don't just make stuff for your ears, you know. We also make things you can read as well. Discover an easy and entertaining way to stay informed this year with The Week magazine. Why not join more than 300,000 readers for a refreshingly open and unbiased digest of world news, expertly curated from a wide range of independent, trusted sources. And just for listening to this podcast, you can get your first six print and digital issues absolutely free. If you order by the 31st of January, then after your trial, you'll continue to save 57% on the shop price and receive complimentary digital access alongside your print subscription. Visit theweek.co.uk slash offer and enter the promo code JANUARY to get the deal. That's promo code JANUARY at theweek.co.uk slash offer. It's the week ending Saturday the 22nd of January and this is The Week Unwrapped. In the past seven days we've seen a volcano erupting in the Pacific causing a tsunami to hit Tonga, the US threatening Russia with sanctions if they launch an attack on Ukraine and the first Tory MP to defect to Labour for 15 years. But we're here to bring you some stories that passed under the radar this week. Big news, not making headlines right now but with repercussions for all our lives. I'm Ollie Mann. Let's unwrap the week. And joining me today from the week's digital team is Joe Evans. Uh, we have the man who makes liquidity sound fun, Money Week's John Stepek. And again, we welcome a new voice to our panel, the punditry gods ye are spoiling us. This time it is assistant editor of The Week magazine, Leif Arbuthnot. Hi, Leif. Hello. Welcome. Thanks for having me on. Pleasure. Uh, it is a tradition on this show, as you may know, that we ask our guests to start by telling us something about themselves that we wouldn't be able to discover by Googling them. <laughs> well, I would say probably it's that I'm an enormous uh, Lord of the Rings nerd and uh, watch the films, which I actually think are better than the books, though I love the books as well, um, you know, virtually every month. You shall pass. <laughs> uh, OK, John, you're up first. What do you think this week should be remembered for? Power to the people. Are we on the verge of a shareholder revolution? BlackRock CEO Larry Fink, his annual letter, it is officially out this morning. I wrote my Dilbert column about it today. And in that letter, Fink writes, quote, shareholder capitalism is not about politics. It is not a social or ideological agenda. It is not woke. And I spoke to him and I started by asking him what he means by all of this. What I'm trying to say is, I mean, many people believe social values or environmental issues are are political and woke. I don't believe that. And by the way, Andrew, um, we, we are connected with more and more asset owners than we've ever been before. I believe our voice it resonates more and more with more asset owners, as evident of now, um, last week and as we have now over $10 trillion of client money. And it's about building deeper, broader, connectivity with your with your stakeholders and for that you're building that durable profitability. Larry Fink, CEO of BlackRock, speaking to CNBC on Tuesday. And John, I'll be honest, I never heard of Larry Fink before, but my ears did uh, prick up when he said that he handled $10 trillion of client money. So who is he and why should we be listening to what he's saying? Well, Larry Fink is the chairman and chief exec of BlackRock and he might really uh, realistically be the most powerful person in the financial world. So BlackRock is the world's largest asset manager, which means that basically whenever you buy a fund, or then there's a good chance that BlackRock runs that fund. So it's got roughly $10 trillion in money on assets under management. And for perspective, that's enough money to buy every single company listed in the FTSE 100 about four times over. So it's a massive amount of money. Now, if you are listening to this podcast and you have a pension, which you almost certainly do, then it means you almost certainly own shares in companies. Now, those shares give you the right to vote on various important aspects of corporate strategy, uh, not least of all the board, the pay of uh, the, the people on the board. And the problem is that Larry Fink, or someone like him, controls all of your voting rights. Because you're investing in a fund, like a portfolio suite of products. Exactly. Um, now, this is this has been something that's been going on for quite a long time. So if, if you invest with any fund manager, it's the same story. But the thing about BlackRock is that it specialises in passive funds. 
The passive funds are those that just track the market rather than trying to beat it. And they've become incredibly popular kind of like over the last two decades or so. But one criticism of them from the, the, the active fund management industry is that they don't then use their voting rights for, for proper stewardship. Yeah. So basically, one, one of the points of being an owner of shares is you get a say in what happens in the company because you own a bit of it. Okay, whereas if you invest in a BlackRock fund, you don't. And he's changed that this week, has he? Well, it's more if you invest in a passive fund. One of the historic kind of like um, criticisms of passive funds is that because passive funds just try to track the market, it means they own bits of all the companies. They own small bits of all the companies. But they don't then buy or sell based on the policies of the companies. They just own the lot. And that's that's the point. That's what they're for. So people have said, well, that's not very good because you're, you're essentially a, a very passive steward. So Larry Fink, in order to kind of uh, counteract those criticisms, has taken to writing to chief executives and chairmen every single year for the last 10 years or so, talking about how they should be thinking about their stakeholders, they should be thinking about how they treat their employees, they should be thinking about the environment. But that in turn has led to other criticisms, which is that, well, what if the people who actually own these shares don't agree with your particular way of doing things? So, sorry, long way of saying this is, in his latest letter, one thing that Larry Fink has picked up on is saying they're committed to a future where every investor, including individual investors, can have the option to take part in votes. And that's what's interesting about this. This is the idea of pushing the ability to have your say in what happens in companies right back down to the individual investor. Okay, so what's happened this week, Joe, is a very rich man has written a letter John thinks this is very important news. It's obviously big news in his world. But how does this affect the likes of dog's bodies like you and me? Well, I mean, to give you a perfect example of this, I am somebody that has a pension. I am somebody that therefore owns uh, shares in a company and so owns a little bit of that company. And I, I have to confess that I'd never really considered until this week when John put us all onto this story, the fact that I probably do then have voting rights. You know, the whole point of shareholder democracy is about one share, one vote, and I've never exercised that right through any of my investments. So this is important in that, as John says, if you were to widen that franchise, if you were widened the number of people that were deciding to vote on these issues, it would likely reflect a change in the way that companies had to respond to their stakeholders' interests and, and their potentially political outlook, social outlook, and would potentially change the way that those companies had to, had to govern themselves. But Leaf, as an individual shareholder, how much power can you wield anyway? I mean, you know, you're talking about owning a suite of products passively through a fund that's just your pension, you're just an individual. I mean, what actually can you influence? I know, I think it's a similar question to the kind of the electoral one, which is that, you know, you go into a voting booth um, every few years and oh no. you tick a box. Have I just said what's the point box. of democracy? <laughs> I think you might well have done. And um, and I think it falls to individual choice about, you know, uh, how how pointless or not you find it. Um, and also interest, you know, I mean, I, I completely see the importance of, of, of uh, the letter. And yet, am I going to use my power um, to, to kind of vote um, uh, to change these companies, maybe move them away from fossil fuels and that kind of thing? No, because I because I can't be bothered and I don't know enough about it. So while I think it's probably good news because it just instinctively feels like a, a good development that um, maybe power is being returned to the little guy, I also think that um, people who are really out of this game, it will pass them by. Yeah, I mean, I suppose, John, what we make of it is less relevant than what CEOs think of it. It is a letter to them, after all. What's the reaction been? Oh, I mean, Larry writes this letter every year. And, you know, I imagine that most CEOs either chuck it in the bin or watch the digest of it on Bloomberg. I think what's interesting about this is that it is the democracy question. Because, in a way, BlackRock and other passive funds started to kind of take the stewardship idea and the uh, the environmental issues and social issues and governance issues more seriously because they were getting criticised for essentially just being kind of vacuous channels of funds into companies with no questions asked. And that didn't matter at first, but, you know, nowadays passive funds between them, the, the three biggest companies in that area own about a fifth of each company in the S&P 500. So America's 500 biggest companies, these companies have massive stakes in them. And so what's happened is that they've come under pressure to kind of 
be more active in the way that they talk about those. But then that sort of led to a backlash where people sit down and they say, oh, Larry Fink, he's just a do-gooder. I mean, one of the reasons that he opened his uh, letter this year, kind of like pushing back against the idea that is kind of of, of woke capitalism, he's sort of trying to emphasise again that, well, no, profits do matter, but the way to be more profitable is to engage with your stakeholders, to engage with important political issues. I think it's just, it's sort of, I mean, it's evidence of a lot of turmoil in the asset management industry as well. Yeah, I mean, I think it boils down to, do you agree with the way that he runs these things? So you could be on either side. You could think he's not woke enough or you could think he's too woke. The point is, it should be up to you as the end shareholder to decide. I wonder to what extent this is generational, Joe. That's what sort of resonated with me reading this letter is I was kind of thinking, here's someone who you'd imagine in your mind might be talking to people in their kind of late middle age um, using the concerns of my generation. And then I kind of think, well, hold on, I'm 40. So actually, that's why, isn't it? (laughs) It's quite important, this stuff now. What was dismissed as a fringe issue, you know, ethics, is actually something that the people who are now beginning to invest strongly in their pensions do care about. No, I think you're quite right. And I think that's interestingly framed in, in Larry Fink's letter in that he doesn't sort of his positioning of these things as just sort of social goods isn't done in necessarily the way that a millennial activist might frame them. It's framed very much in terms of this is just good capitalism. You know, he he, he quotes where he says stakeholder capitalism isn't about politics. It's not social or ideological. And, and I think that's very different to the way that possibly, you know, somebody in their 20s or 30s that's out campaigning against fossil fuels might frame that issue. The issue here, I think, is that one kind of follows the other in that John has just said there that the position that I think he's trying to take here is that, you know, good corporate governance is part of a good way to drive profit. I suspect that's only true if you get the stakeholder engagement that he's describing. I I suspect that actually if the stakeholders aren't hugely interested in how the company is governed or about issues of corporate governance, you probably can turn quite good profits while pretty much ignoring some ethical concerns that some of your stakeholders may have. And so I think actually what needs to happen here really for this to be as impactful as I suppose Larry Fink would like it to be is for that franchise widening to be functional. You know, they need to open the door to allow it, allow people to vote, to make it easier. As Leif said, most people can't be bothered. I, to be honest, probably can't be bothered. And unless it becomes easier, people aren't going to engage with these issues, which is going to mean that actually corporate governance still is put on the back burner because companies are quite happy just to kind of ignore their stakeholders' individual needs because they're not being voiced through their voting rights. Yeah. Leif, I know you've been reading the letter as well. I'm going to come to you in a minute and ask what you thought whilst you were reading it. But just on that point, John, of how you could make it easier, what are the practical ways that actually shareholders can exercise this new right if Fink is correct that that's the direction we're heading in? Like, Actually, if if your average punter can't be bothered, how can you motivate them to do something? How practically can they influence things? Well, I, think, I mean, that's a good point. I mean, conveniently, my, my colleague Merrin Somerset Webb's just written a book on this topic called Share Power, which you should all rush out and buy because she's my friend and my boss. But um, <laughs> what I would say is, uh, well, there, there's two things. So there's the internet, uh, which obviously makes things much easier. Um, you know, there, there are already, for example, um, I own some individual stocks, just essentially just for fun. And the broker that I'm with will alert you whenever there's a vote coming out and enable you to vote on the various resolutions. That's very straightforward. There's a lot of uh, infrastructure between, say, a company like BlackRock and the end investor that would need to be built. But none of it is, is, is difficult. And there's lots of small companies actually working on it just now. And just in terms of engagement, I think one thing that's worth highlighting about this is there are comparisons to electoral democracy, but there's also there's a very small group of people who are controlling these voting blocks at the moment. And I think one of the best examples is director pay. Now, director pay has been a bit of a scandal for years and years and years. You know, like chief executives, you know, even to, you know, I'm a red-blooded capitalist, but I do not think that someone in a managerial position for 10 years should be getting generational wealth from 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 doing that you know it, it's kind of ridiculous you know these people aren't entrepreneurs but they're getting multiple multiple millions um and as i say you no know, changing their, their 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 family's lives forever um 
So if you object to that, and I think a lot of kind of ordinary people, if you like, do, then I think that, you know, voting on that would very rapidly show that most people don't approve of these kind of pay packages. But at the moment, because all the voting power is in the hands of people who also get paid outlandishly high pay packages, they don't really see anything wrong with it. And there's not really a huge benefit to a fund manager who gets paid you know, a six-figure salary every single year to objecting to an equally high or higher salary on behalf of a chief executive. So I think you could see quite a big change actually quite quickly. All right, citizen Stepek, stand down. Uh, <laughs> Leif, you've read the letter as well, as I said. What was, what was your abiding uh, impression of it? I found it kind of interesting and 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 it was full of uh you know the classic corporate jargon so it was a bit like nick comey you had to kind of find <laughs> the find the interesting stuff um but then but then when you actually you know the the, the nits themselves were <laughs> notable <laughs> to use a really beautiful metaphor um i was also struck by um the, the the line that he he said that um no relationship has been changed more by the pandemic than the one between employers and employees um, and calls attention to this whole rate resignation as it's been termed um the quit rate in the US and the UK being at historic highs he says so um i think it was it was kind of satisfying to 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 read about someone so powerful really um accepting that the world has completely changed post pandemic um and that uh, and maybe heralding a new era for um relationships between people in companies and and the people at the top of them so yeah, I, I thought it was it made for very interesting reading, even if um, there's a lot of kind of blue sky thinking uh, in the in the letter. I mean, just finally, uh, John, you, you sort of said slightly dismissively earlier. Oh, Larry writes this letter every year. Is your sense this sort of an ego trip for him? Really, like I said, I hadn't heard of him. I'd heard of Black Rock. Is it a case of him trying to build his own profile by writing this thing every year, or does it have real significance? I mean, when I say that, I mean it's got significance in the same way that something like Davos has got significance. If you know, what I, mean. I mean, like he he is a well known name in the financial world, and you're right, you're not generally going to see him outside of that world because, I mean, I, I guess as you might have gathered from my kind of rambling monologue at the start of this piece, it's quite complicated and there's lots of kind of um it's a technical job that he does there aren't many very well known uh because he's not even a fund manager he's not even somebody like neil woodford who might get a glimmer of fame um he's not actually picking and choosing shares on anyone's behalf is his letter Um, an ego trip no okay (laughs) no it's (laughs) <laughs> Good, because you brought it forward as your story of the week, so I'm glad that you can defend it a bit. Uh, okay, Joe, you're up next after this. Joe, your turn. What do you think this week should be remembered for? Is civil war brewing in Europe's backyard? Bosnia and Herzegovina is experiencing its worst political crisis since the 1990s. Milorad Dodik, the Serb member of Bosnia's tripartite presidency, has been calling for the secession of the Republika Srpska from Bosnia and its integration with neighboring Serbia. He has repeatedly threatened to pull out the Serb representatives from Bosnia's armed forces, tax system and judiciary and create separate Serb institutions. Turkish broadcaster TRT World reporting from the Balkans last week. Uh, Sounds concerning, Joe. What's happened this week? So this week, the UN have joined the crowd of voices warning about rising hate speech in Bosnia ahead of national elections scheduled to take place in October this year. The UN's warning specifically came after Bosnian Serbs celebrated their national day um, on Sunday the 16th which marks the creation of the Serb enclave referred to in that clip known as the Republika Srpska. One incident during the National Day saw Serb nationalists firing shots in the air outside of a mosque. Um, There was the unveiling of a large portrait of the convicted war criminal Ratko Mladic, as is alluded to in that clip as well, by supporters of the football club Red Star Belgrade. Coming after the threats made by Milorad Dodik that were also spoken about in that clip, it really has sort of set pulses racing about the possibility that the, the the drums of war are once again banging in Bosnia. I know we've just asked John to explain a very complicated aspect of financial management in a few minutes, so you know what's coming next. But for those of us who don't remember in detail, talk us through as best you can some historical context here. So since 1995, there's been a trio of presidents, hasn't there? So there's one for the Serbs, one for the Bosniaks, who are the Bosnian Muslims, and one for the Croats. How did that solution come about? And... Was it ever a realistic long-term answer to the problems that this region's got? So 
Bosnian history and bullet points. This is going to be <laughs> yes, please. This is my worst nightmare because when you talk to anybody from the Balkans about history, they refer back to things that happened 400 years ago. So I won't do that. I'll start in 1995. <laughs> the Triumvirate Power Sharing Agreement came out of the 1995 Dayton Agreement, which was an agreement signed to end the war in Bosnia that people may be familiar with. Um, what that created was a slightly uneasy... The Dayton as in Dayton, Ohio, right? That's Dayton, where it was Ohio group, yes. So what that created was a slightly uneasy truce. Um, the Republic of Serbska was allowed to remain as a sort of semi-autonomous enclave of Bosnia um, and the Triumvirate Power Sharing Agreement was agreed in order to maintain Bosnia as a multi-ethnic state split between, as you say, Bosnian Croats, Bosnian Muslims, that are sometimes referred to as Bosniaks and Bosnian Serbs. The reason that truce was slightly uncomfortable is because the boundaries of Republic of Serbska very closely were mapped onto areas that Bosniaks argued had been ethnically cleansed during the war in the early 1990s. And Bosnian Serb nationalists were also very unhappy with that agreement because essentially their position is that the Republic of Serbska should be part of Serbia and not a part of Bosnia and Herzegovina at all. And so while the peace has held ever since, it's never been a particularly fulfilling solution for either side of that conflict. Is your sense, Leif, that the international community has slightly taken their eye off the ball in the Balkans? Absolutely. I think that the, especially the kind of looming crisis in Ukraine um, means that people, they're looking away and um, that could really come back to uh, bite the international community. But in what way might it come back to bite? I mean, again, without going into everything to do with the 90s, I suppose one of the reasons that there wasn't immediate intervention is it wasn't obvious, apart from humanity and ethics, what the national interest to intervene would be for a lot of nations. It's true. And uh, there's that there's the worry as well that, you know, that whatever the international community does um, ends up kind of you know, not working or in fact making things worse. So um, I think, I mean, and that's, you know, completely legitimate. You don't want to get involved in a, in a country without um, knowing that, it's, that it might actually help that country out. And I think, um, especially in places uh, like in the US, I think, you know, there's so, so much less appetite for kind of uh, f- even just reading about foreign affairs. I was looking on Twitter the other day and there was a, a copy of, of the Times um, from decades ago, maybe it was the 1960s or something. And there were so many foreign news stories on the front cover and now you know stories like this just don't they're they're kind of stuck in the the foreign pages and um and 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 often people readers um don't even you know get there uh so it is it is it's worrying that um there's this kind of total lack of interest um from from normal people uh who are just going about their days but but it's also it also makes sense but it's partly john isn't it just because it is complicated um most people i mean i'm talking about in britain here i mean it's different if you're turkish or whatever obviously but most people in britain just don't have the basic understandings of all the different ethnic groups for example to even begin with well i mean yes yeah, it's, it's i've got to be honest this is a conflict that i remember it breaking out obviously um in the the 90s and, you know, I remember at the time, one of the most striking things was that Yugoslavia was somewhere that people went on holiday, like Spain or Portugal. And uh, suddenly, like, you know, there was like, you know, concentration camps and kind of genocide and stupid things like the names involved as well. I mean, and most people could barely put these countries. I, I couldn't tell you where these countries are specifically in relation to each other on a map um, without looking at Google. So, yeah, it's it's very complicated. And there is also that whole point about, well, and also what do you do about it? Because, as, I mean, the last intervention, as far as I can see, also kind of, you know, there was a, a lot of mixed kind of feelings about that in the long run over how effective or how ineffective it was. And obviously, since then, our record of muscular liberal intervention has not been good. Um so, yeah, it's like, do you just make things worse if you get involved is the other problem? Well, with those memories, John, how did you react hearing about this potentially rearing its head again? That's a horrible idea. Um, you know, at, at the time, it was one of those awful, depressing situations where you're confused and terrible things are happening, but um, it's, again, not kind of like clear what anyone should be doing. And on the one hand, you feel a bit of relief whenever you see that, you know, somebody's authorised a strike force to go and bomb, you know, the baddies. But then, you know, later on you can realise, well, wait a minute, who are the baddies in this? And, you know, how do you get to a point? I suppose it's like any kind of ethnic stroke borders conflict. I mean, you know, to to draw a very obvious parallel, it's like Ireland has been 
um, and the situation in Ireland has been an ongoing kind of discussion and, and problem with kind of Britain for hundreds of years. So it's it's hard to see how there's an easy solution to prevent this sort of thing from flaring up. Who's Doddick got on his side, Joe? Do you think he's, you know, properly representing uh, the people that he's elected to serve in that sense? Or is it his more extremist wing that he's trying to appeal to? One has to be really careful when they talk about this because there are lots of Bosnian Serbs that completely buy into the notion of Bosnia being a multi-ethnic state, as do most Bosniaks and Bosnian Croats. That said, there is a very large and and worrying um, Serbian nationalist wing in Bosnia and and also in in Serbia. In terms of who Dodik looks to further afield for support, there is a concern, again, looking back to the precedent set in the 90s, that should conflict break out in Bosnia again, once again, Russia and Serbia, who in the 90s under Slobodan Milosevic supported uh, the Republic of Srpska, will once again be there to prop up Dodik and supply him with the kind of arms and financial support needed to you know, create serious problems in the country. That's been made slightly more concerning by the fact that the Serbian government has also been on something of a shopping spree for weapons in recent times. And so there is a slight sense that the Serbian army is sort of rising from the ashes, having decayed after the 1990s. As John just said, the difficulty here is, as we saw in the 90s, it's a very confusing and complicated situation, as ethnic conflicts always are. In the 1990s, what we saw was sort of international communities, specifically in the West, dragged their feet for a very long time. And that was only really shifted or moved by the Clinton administration, who it was that eventually sort of pushed NATO intervention in Bosnia. Whether we'd get that same response from the Biden White House is an open question. You know, I discussed on the year unwrapped about the sort of decision by Biden to withdraw the US from global conflicts. And so whether there would be the appetite there to do that same thing again, I I doubt. What I don't doubt is that if, if ethnic conflict does break out, the people who back the Serbian side of this dispute, places like Russia and Serbia, will not be shy about dipping their toes into this conflict because, you know, Bosnia is a very important uh, geopolitical pinch point between Europe and Russia. And so I don't think they will have any issue with trying to destabilise the region as much as possible, as we've seen in places like Belarus in in, uh, Ukraine. And and also, as we've seen, Russia has an appetite for becoming quite muscularly involved in former Soviet states, as they did in in Kazakhstan a few weeks ago. Leif, as much as we can work out from the UK, how, how are people in Bosnia responding to all of this? It's pretty difficult because opinion polling on this is not very reliable and there isn't much of it. So, for instance, uh, Reuters, the news agency, went to Pale, which used to be the um, a kind of hub of separatist forces um, in, during the war. And they spoke to people there and uh, they said that every person that they spoke to expressed dismay over what they saw as a recipe for disaster in Dodik's actions. So um, there seems to be um, a lot of fear um, that, that, you know, this could all go horribly wrong. And at a glance at Bosnian Twitter, um, especially Bosniak Twitter, which is, you know, Bos- Bosnian Muslim Twitter, shows that people um, really are getting worried about another outbreak of violence. While we don't have extensive evidence for concern that we might, if it were a country where, where those kind of that sort of research was a bit more um, extensive, it, um, there are definitely indications that people are worried. John, there is an election coming up. Do you think... Uh, maybe a positive way of looking at this is he's, you know, chucking red meat at the uh, supporters who need to hear this sort of thing before the election. And then when he wins, he might dial back from this position a bit. I mean, obviously, that is possible. I think the the tricky thing is that this is a bit different to say somebody like even Trump kind of play into their base. I mean, th- this is actually somewhere that's seen massacres in very recent history. And it is also somewhere, as Joe says, where there are a lot of bad actors who would like to stir up kind of trouble. Put it this way, if if anyone in the UN is actually paying attention to this, they, they should probably be, you know, making more of an effort to try to do something about it, whatever that might be, rather than crossing their fingers and hoping it all goes away after the election. And Joe, I can see on the webcam you've got your crystal ball out. That's fortunate, because uh, I'm going to finish by asking you what's going to happen. I mean, I would hate to say that the country explodes into ethnic violence again, because obviously that would be a a horrendous outcome and that would invariably pull in Western powers and Eastern powers in in a way that I don't think anybody would be able to avoid. In the run-up to the election, it will be very interesting to keep an eye on what happens. I I, I suspect that this isn't just a case of Doddick throwing red meat to the base in that, you know, he is a, a frequent genocide denier. He's someone that has spoken about the need for the existence of a greater Serbia, which is this sort of 
semi-historical, semi-mythological idea that Serb nationalists hold about the boundaries that Serbia should um, should have. And so I suspect that this isn't something that will dissipate post-election, and it's something that certainly has the potential to flare up pre-election in quite unpredictable and, and quite frightening ways, I think. Mm. Thanks for the briefing, nonetheless. Leif, we'll be coming to you next after this. <laughs> OK, Leif, you are finishing the show. What do you think this week should be remembered for? Will the next Archbishop be more like the Pope? A quiet English market town on the River Stour. The ancient Saxons called it Canterbury, the town of the men of Kent. Heavy with history, Canterbury has more than once dictated the destiny of England, with the cathedral the focal point. Slow news day. Uh, British Movie Tone reporting on the enthronement of Dr Coggan as the new Archbishop of Canterbury in 1975. It's amazing that's what the news sounded like as recently as then. (laughs) Um, (laughs) But uh, Leif, what's happened this week? Well, the Archbishop of of Canterbury has launched a consultation to basically change the way that archbishops are picked. Now, the the kind of, uh, the process is is fairly complicated. The the Prime Minister is advised about who the next archbishop should be by committee. He then gives that name to the Queen and she usually says, well, I think she always says yes. The plan is to rebalance the the composition of the committee that actually comes up with the with the name so that it includes more countries um, outside of the UK, the, the Anglican communities that are not English, um, because basically there, there are there are fewer um, Anglicans in England than there are in the rest of the world. And the idea is that the Archbishop of, of Canterbury shouldn't just be largely picked by English church people, but should be picked by church people from um, all over the world. Yeah, I mean, it's a success story, the Anglican church, sort of everywhere else <laughs> from where it's based, isn't it? So there's a community of 80 million worshippers across 42 independent Anglican churches worldwide, uh, but this declining fellowship in Britain. So uh, in the current process... Do the international community of Anglicans have no say there? No, they they do have one person on the committee of 16 people. Wow. And they represent, you know... Africa and Australasia, for example. Yeah, exactly. And so, so the um, plan isn't to um, reduce. I mean, it is to. It's not to reduce that that person's part. It's to increase the number of people who represent um, the Anglican Communion outside the UK. But it's also to reduce the the um, influence of people in the diocese of Canterbury itself. Uh, because right now, the, the Diocese of Canterbury has a big say in who gets to be the next Archbishop of Canterbury, as you might expect. But basically, the Archbishop, um, Justin Welby, has said that about 5% of his time is spent on matters relating to the Canterbury Diocese. So it doesn't really make sense that um, the Archbishop of Canterbury should be so heavily influenced by the views of the Diocese I mean, John, this is itself. obviously the most important election in the Anglican Church. But nonetheless, uh, you know, as Leif was saying, it's the Queen who's technically the head of the church. So even within the Anglican Church, they're sort of acknowledging that it's not that important who the Archbishop of Canterbury is, or York, or Westminster, or whatever. It's it's a it's a figurehead. It's not like the Pope. It's not a papal system. Does it matter? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that's that would be an ecumenical matter. Um, <laughs> I... You're who I always turn to for my ecumenical matters. <laughs> Um, I guess. Like, does it matter? I mean, put it this way: I, I'm I'm an ex-Catholic, so I'm not incredibly involved with the, uh, the the Church of England. But I mean, the person who I've heard of, obviously, is the Archbishop of Canterbury, and Justin Welby is the first person they turn to every time they want a comment on something remotely linked to anything that the church might have a uh, generally slightly vacuous opinion on. So I think it does matter in that. He might not be, I mean, the Queen might be the figurehead, but he's the spokesperson. So, yeah, I, I think if they want to be more inclusive, and this is, a, again, a classic kind of, you know, Anglican church <laughs> kind of dilemma, um, then, yeah, I mean, they probably should spread it out to where they have the bigger congregations, although clearly that brings its own problems. Well, yes. Let's talk about those, Joe. And if you outline this dilemma, essentially it's on issues like gay marriage and women bishops, isn't it? You know, I'm generalising hugely about a continent here, but obviously the African representatives, for example, are going to have what would be seen by most Brits as less progressive views than their British equivalents. They are further behind on the journey to having female bishops. 
And so if you're representing them, you're at the same time not representing the views in England. Yes. So I'm, I'm not sure whether the people that drew up this consultation are part of the same members club as Larry Fink, but it was slightly kind of phased in a way that could be described as, as very woke. You know, one of the things that the that the consultation said is that, you know, the spread of Anglicanism worldwide is rooted in, in England's colonial history and that this is a way to extend the franchise again, to use the phrase that I used earlier about voting rights, to, to people that the church represents, essentially. The difficulty is the one you've just raised, Ollie, that, you know, for example, churches in Uganda are strongly opposed to same-sex marriage, where churches in the US and Scotland conduct gay weddings. The other issue that's been raised by some uh, Anglicans is it massively reduces the odds of a female Archbishop of Canterbury being selected if areas of the world that do ordain female priests but don't allow them to serve as bishops are are allowed to vote on, on who represents the church in this sort of pivotal figurehead role. So while it does have very good intentions, you know, widening the range of voices that are able to vote on the figurehead of their church, it could accidentally have quite unprogressive results, which is, I don't think, the intention. Leif, how does the Anglican Church compare in other countries in other ways? Uh, I'm sort of imagining sort of a hilarious scene of the Queen being involved in a kind of high-spirited evangelical (laughs) (laughs) sing-along. There does seem to be a bit of a culture clash. Yeah, there definitely there definitely is, and um, the um, the Archbishop uh, Justin Welby has has often said that um, the average Anglican is, I think, a, a a single woman with three children who's thirty in in an African country, which isn't what you would think. I'd say that the um, there there is much less of a division in in some of the Anglican communions outside of um, the UK, uh, whereas it, it, in the UK there's there's quite a lot of the kind of factions within the church of the the people who are sort of um, the great modernizers. Um, and and the people who are who are anti modernization and um generally the people who are anti modernization are not welcoming this change a uh, criticism of the change which i found quite amusing is that um some anglicans in in britain are, are accusing justin welby of trying to become a mini pope by basically you know being much more representative of the the world anglican communion um which uh, i found quite quite endearing as a criticism <laughs> there's also another element of it john that strikes me Which is, if you underline the appeal of the Anglican Church internationally, you start to ask why they have such an establishment role here. If they are an international church, why are there bishops in the House of Lords? I mean, that's that's a really good question. It's not even one that I'd kind of uh, thought about. I mean, I think one of the interesting things about England specifically as a country, in in my experience of living in Scotland and and England, um, is that England is a genuinely basically atheist country like like religion really doesn't play any role beyond a ceremonial one i know that there's a, a not a small group of people who do go to church and things like that and there's a sort of there's an element of cultural kind of christianity but there isn't a, a kind of the same sort of tribal sense that you get between you know catholics and protestants and things like that that you get in scotland um and uh yeah, I mean, the, does the church have that much influence here? And does it, uh, like, is it justified that every time something happens, somebody does run off and phone up the Archbishop of Canterbury and say, "What's your reaction to this?" I don't know. I mean, I don't, I don't really think so. And I suspect that most people in England aren't that bothered about this. But that is one problem. I mean, that is one reason why, you know, the Church of England wants to be quite progressive. But if your most enthusiastic members are not progressive and they're also not English, then where does the church go from there? But then it's so interesting, isn't it, this idea of sort of progressive and representation coming up against each other, Joe. I mean, to take the gay and lesbian example, obviously even in Britain, the gay and lesbian community is a minority. Whereas if you're talking about your international Anglican community, it's Britain that's the minority. (laughs) And within that, a minority of your fellowship and within that, it's only a minority of your followership to whom these rules even apply. So it is really tricky for them, isn't it, to do both things at once? Yeah, I, I wouldn't want to unpick the tenets of democracy for a second time on this podcast. But this is the <laughs> difficulty, right? And it's the, it's the same thing that, that flares up any time there's a slightly terrifying poll about the reintroduction of capital punishment, where, you know, liberal, progressive people, which I use slightly flippantly as two different things, but to group them in the same category 
are horrified by the idea that capital punishment would be reintroduced, but also believe that everybody should have their say on the issue. And so you end up at this sort of stalemate between, you know, you can quite often back these people into a corner by saying, so what should we do? Should we have a vote on it or should we just never ask people? And this is the difficulty here. And it's the difficulty with Brexit. It's the difficulty with any of these divisive social or political issues that widening the franchises is, is great on paper, but it does then mean that you have to live with what the people say when you hand them the ballot paper and, and sometimes that isn't quite as palatable as your original widening of the franchise idea might have been. And Leif, just finally to return to your point about contrasting this with the Catholic Church and their selection process. I mean, could this work from the point of view of could we end up with a big reveal like they do with the Pope with the coloured smoke and all the rest of it that the world actually is interested in so that John's not saying why do we care what the Archbishop says? you know, it will become more of an event? I, I mean, I would love to see a bit more, um, you know, ceremony with, with the way that the Archbishop is picked because it might sh- it might get people a bit more interested in going to church in the UK. Um, and I, there was a recent statistic as well about how ch- Sunday church service attendance has halved in the last 30 years. Um, it's exactly um, as we were discussing that basically um, atheism is very much, um, you know, now more than half of the UK population say that they have no religion. But I don't think that these changes could actually, they're not sadly about um, introducing a bit more glamour, pomp, ceremony into the, into the into this very dry process. And I don't think that they're eye catching enough, um, even though the changes are quite dramatic within um, if they go through within the within the church itself. I don't think that they will um, necessarily catch on and, and, and get people's attention that are not already quite nerdily interested in church affairs. Well, uh, please be upstanding now and turn to page 135 for our hymn of podcast thanks. Joe, John and Leaf, hallowed be their names. Very promising debut, Leaf. Do come again. Uh, remember, you can follow this show for free, uh, <laughs> just like the Anglican Church. <laughs> we, we do sometimes ask for donations in the form of subscriptions to the magazine. Uh, and you can get every episode as soon as it's released. Just search for The Week Unwrapped wherever you get your podcasts. And if you found us today via a Spotify playlist, then tap Go to Podcast and then tap Follow Now. I've been Ollie Mann. Our music is by Tom Morby, the producer Sophie King at Rethink Audio. And until we meet again to unwrap next week, amen. <laughs>